We're in this part of John chapter 5 where Jesus is presenting himself to the Jewish leaders. And they have to decide, okay, is this true? Here is a, a man who claims to be God. How do you know if something is true? You have to look for evidence, don't you? Some kind of fact that establishes the truth. If you find enough evidence, then you can accept a statement as true. And Jesus is offering proof that he is who he says he is. The Son of God, the Son of Man, the Messiah. The problem is that the Jewish leaders reject Jesus' testimony. And they say, you know what? You're nothing but a Sabbath breaker. You are a blasphemer making yourself out to be God. And what Jesus is saying in this section is, I'm not on trial. You guys are. Because my evidence is perfect. And my evidence should be believed. So there's nothing wrong with me, but there is something wrong with you. So that is the scripture we're going to be looking at here in John chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 31. Jesus says, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you have, do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings... How will you believe my words? So Jesus here understands the need for testimony. There's a small child behind that door, okay? So he's going to check in with us every once in a while. That's what's going on. Only when you see a face there going like this do you know we're in trouble. Where are we? Jesus does not expect anybody to just say, oh yeah, he's the Messiah, no problem. I'm in. You know, that would be silly. If somebody comes along and says he's God, there are two possibilities, maybe three. One is he's crazy. You can ignore him. Two, this guy's wicked. He's lying. He's not God. So he's out to rip you off. But the third possibility is, is that he really is the Messiah. <coughs> but how do you figure this stuff out? 
if you follow somebody claiming to be God and they're not God, you're headed for trouble. You are going to be ripped off. And people have done this throughout history. They've shown up and they said, I'm the Messiah. And then horrible things happen. There's no such thing as a good deception. So, Jesus shows that he knows the biblical requirements for giving testimony. There in verse 31. It's in the Law of Moses in different places. Numbers chapter 35, Deuteronomy 19, Deuteronomy 17. Every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So Jesus says, if I bear witness of myself, my testimony is not true. We both understand this. So let me give you now the additional testimony that proves he's the Messiah. And he first of all points to John the Baptist. Now, again, you have to appreciate how weighty this evidence is that before the John the Baptist, you have no word from God for 400 years. Nothing. And the Jewish people went through hardship, difficulty, all of it, praying to God, but no word from God until John the Baptist comes. And he's in the wilderness, and he's preaching repentance. He's saying, one comes after me whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. He says, I am the voice that Isaiah spoke about crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And John is this character that communicates the fact that he really is from God. Here's a guy that cares nothing about what's going on in the cities. He's out in the wilderness. He doesn't go into the city and say, hey, I'm something special, but I'll tell you out in the wilderness. He's preaching to nothing. And somebody hears him and goes, wow, I better go back and get my friends. They meet him, but he's not coming to them. And such is his presence that people go out in droves to listen to him. And what do they see? A guy wearing this skin kind of hairy clothing, kind of, he doesn't care about fashion. He's not wearing a 300 pound suit. Comb that hair. This guy is eating locusts and wild honey. Does he care about anything? Two things. One, you better repent. And two, that guy right there is the Messiah. That's all he cares about. Even if it looks like that guy is kind of siphoning off his ministry, he doesn't care. So here's a guy who's completely everything he's got into this one thing, pointing to the Messiah, testifying that everybody needs to repent. And Jesus says, he was the burning and shining lamp and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. At a certain point, these Jewish leaders were kind of going, well, yeah, kind of interesting. They thought it was okay. Ultimately, they rejected it. But John even was beginning to appeal to them. They were coming out. They were listening to him. They thought, well, maybe... That's how powerful his testimony was. And yet, Jesus says on another level, it is human testimony. And he says in verse 34, I don't receive testimony from man because he only receives the testimony of God. That's what makes him the judge, is he's not judging on his own seeing, his own hearing. But he's listening to the Father who knows everything and so his judgment is completely according to truth. 
So he doesn't receive the testimony from men. He's not looking to become popular and say, I want you to support me. He's saying, I'm saying this so that you can be saved. He is important. And in the other Gospels, he says of everyone who's ever born, there's nobody more important than John the Baptist. So he says, that's a testimony. But he says, I have greater testimony than this. Human testimony is important. Divine testimony is more important. So he says, I have a greater witness than John. The Father is testifying to me. And that's what he's been telling these Jewish leaders. I can do nothing by myself, but only as the Father shows me these things I do. And he's just healed a gentleman who's been sick and helpless for 38 years. Something only God could do. He says, these very works bear witness that the Father has sent me because only the Father could do them through me. And you have to marvel at the fact that Jesus does not point to himself. He's always pointing to the Father. He's not trying to make himself out as anybody in himself, but he's saying, I represent the Father. So these miracles display his humility that is really rare. You don't see this in people. But then he says in verse 37, the Father has testified of me. And he goes on to say, you've never seen the Father, you have never heard his voice, and yet the Father has testified of me. And where the Father has done that is in his word. The word of God testifies to Jesus. And you think, this is impeccable, faultless, perfect testimony because it's so detailed. You know that Jesus fulfilled somewhere around 300 prophecies on his first coming. And it would be virtually impossible for anyone to fulfill seven of them by accident. They've done a lot of work on probabilities and it would be unthinkable that anyone could go on to do 300 prophecies, fulfill them all by accident. Or even if you were running around trying to fulfill them, saying, hey, I'm the Messiah, look, I'm doing this. Hey, I'm doing that. Because these signs, these prophecies are divine. The Messiah is going to be the one who gives sight to the blind. People can't do that. He heals lepers. He raises people from the dead. All right. In the volume of the book, it is written about Jesus in so many ways. You've got the five books of Moses. You've got all the law and the testimony. You've got the Psalms. You've got the prophets. And really, as the angel explained to the Apostle John in Revelation, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That is, it's all about Jesus. That's what you're going to find when you read the Bible. So, not only has the Father testified, but then Jesus says, Moses testifies of me. Moses wrote those first five books and Psalm 90. And he specifically said, the Lord is going to raise up for you a prophet like me. And Peter quotes Moses in Acts chapter 3 verse 22. And he says, anyone who does not listen to him will be destroyed from among the people. That's how important 
this prophet, prophet is. Okay, it's a little bit busy this morning. <laughs> but we're going to focus. Stick with me. Anybody who doesn't listen to this prophet, who is like Moses, is going to be destroyed from the people. So what is it to be like Moses? Have you ever thought about that? Some people think about the miracles and the plagues. And obviously, God did powerful things through Moses. It wasn't Moses doing it, but it was the Father doing the miracles through Moses. Like when Moses lifts up his rod, the Red Sea parts. Did lifting up his rod do that? No, but the Father did that through Moses. Okay. Well, another thing about Moses is that his face glowed. It shined. And that was because of his relationship with the Father. That is, God says, I speak face to face with him, not in dreams, not in visions, so he has a relationship with Moses that is unique among prophets, face to face. But here's the aspect in which Jesus resembles Moses, in which he is like Moses, only better. Yes, he's got the power. Yes, he's got the relationship. But it's the humility. That is... God said to Moses, I want you to work for me, and I want you to do everything that I tell you to do. And Moses says, no. And God says, yes, you will. And after a while, Moses says, I get it, okay. And that was the source of Moses' ministry, is that he did everything that God told him to do. Now, it says that Moses was the meekest man who ever lived. And it was Moses who wrote that. <laughs> Why? Because God told him to. Okay, fine, whatever. But as you look at Moses' life, he did everything that God told him to do. Even when God says, okay, that's it. Turn around, take this people out into the desert. We're going to march for 38 years until they're all dead. That's what I want you to do. Moses does it. Right up until he cracked. The people are clamoring for water. They said, you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. There's no water here. Moses says, what do I do? God says, Take the rod with you, go out to the rock, and speak to it, and it will give you water. Moses takes the rod, and he walks out, and he faces the rock, and then he turns around and says, Must we bring water out of this rock for you rebels? And he turns around and he hits the rock, and he hits it again. All the water comes out. God says, you didn't represent me properly. You didn't fulfill my will. Why not? Because he was angry. He cracked. He had enough. And he took it personal. But God wasn't angry. And see, this, was, this is what Moses was supposed to do. All you have to do, Moses, is be faithful to me. Humble yourself. Obey me. And Moses was faithful in all God's house. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 3. And in order to be faithful, the precursor to that is humility. Because whenever you take it personal, whenever you decide to either goof off or get angry or whatever, you're doing your own thing. And you can't be faithful. So, here is Jesus. And the real essence of his ministry and 
who he is is the fact that he is humble, like Moses, only greater, completely humble, completely faithful. And so he's saying, Moses wrote about me. He is a testimony to me. Well, we have a problem because these men do not believe Jesus. But it's not the fact that he has lousy evidence. It's because they're not even thinking about it. They're not even looking at it. They're not even thinking or looking. Did I say thinking and looking? They're not. How can this be? These guys have been the interpreters of the scriptures for the last hundred years. That's the kind of tradition they represent. They know the scriptures. They memorize them when they, at the age of five. So they know all of this stuff. Why don't they believe? And the answer is, first of all, they have a superficial relationship with the Word of God. Isn't that ironic? They memorize it, they teach it, they interpret it, but it's shallow. It's superficial. It's only outward. Now, Jesus says in verse 38, you do not have his word abiding in you. Abiding. And that's really the difference. Head knowledge is fabulous. But the scriptures, the word of God is meant, intended to be planted in our hearts. Exactly what Eleanor was talking about. To be part of us. They're supposed to take root in our hearts, in the deepest part of us, and grow there. And when the scriptures are living and growing in our hearts, then they transform us in what we think and in what we do. That is, in Psalm 119, it says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. So the psalmist knew that if he put the word of God in his heart, it would affect his actions. I will not sin against you because your word is living in me, changing the way I think. But then ultimately, the word of God changes the way you think so that you change the way you act. And here's a dangerous thing with having a superficial knowledge of the Word of God is that you think, I'm okay. I know this stuff. And you know more than most people around you. You can ask her all, answer all the questions that people ask because you've heard them before. So you can, you can give the knowledge and people are impressed by that. Whoa! You must be a godly person because you knew the answer and you understand the scriptures. Wow, you're godly. And it's a very easy trap for a Bible teacher to get into that and say, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I'm an authority. We have been doing this for the last hundred years. But knowing is not the same as doing. And ultimately, Jesus said that it's not the one that hears my words that's going to have a solid foundation. It's the one who hears my words and does them. And that's always been the case for the scriptures. You can know the scriptures and not do them. And you can develop the attitude that that's for everybody else. I'm okay. My job is just to do this and I do it and I'm doing my job and everything's cool and I'm okay. But then Jesus says, 
you do not have his word abiding in you. It has nothing to do with you. You have no relationship with that word of God. Now, the second reason why these guys don't believe is that they are unwilling to come to Jesus. That's what he says in verse 40. You're not willing to come to me. Why is that? Well, when you plant the scriptures inside you and they've taken root and they're growing, how they transform you is they humble you. That word will work in you to show you what you're really like. The essence of pride is that I think I'm better than I really am. But here's the awful thing. When you plant the word of God in your heart, you're going to find out, I'm not that at all. I'm a, I'm a terrible person. I'm a sinner. I should be dead. What am I doing alive? How can God even keep me alive? It humbles you. What happens if you have a superficial relationship with the Word of God? Well, you just go on thinking you're hot stuff and your deodorant is still working when it's not. Everybody else can tell, but somehow you're not aware that you have problems. So guess what? These guys say, why should we go out to this What's his face upstart? Who does he think he is? He should come to us. He should submit to us. What is he thinking? He's God. He needs to come to us. But here's a real problem. In verse 42, he says, I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. See, the Word of God is going to go deep into your heart, send down roots, grow, but there's a purpose to that. This humility results in all kind of good things. Every good thing comes out of humility. And the most important is love. Love towards God that puts His interests and His pleasure and his goodness ahead of your own. You can't do that if you're thinking of yourself first. You're going to say, I'm not going to obey you. That's going to hurt. Forget you. No love for God there. So you need this humility so that you can love God and say, you know what? Your loving kindness is better than life. Anything you want, even if I get killed, I'm yours. But then that fruit is also going to result in loving others because that's what pleases God. That's the entire essence of the law of Moses, all 613 of them. If you love everybody, you're great. And if you don't, it doesn't matter who you are, you're nothing. Well, he says, you got all your Bible knowledge. You're guys, you're really something, but you don't love God at all. Not with all those laws you're working at. So they know a lot of scripture. They teach others their authorities, but guess what? They're dead. As far as a relationship with God, they're dead. And they seek glory from one another. In verse 44, Jesus says, I understand it. It's impossible for you to believe because you're not thinking about God. You're not thinking about how to please God and how to glorify God. You're thinking, how can I get everybody to glorify me? I want everybody to think well of me. I want everybody to be impressed with me. And when I walk in the room, I want everybody to go, oh, He's here. You can't believe like that. It's impossible. You're worried about yourselves. So, Jesus says, you cannot reject this testimony without consequences. 
That is, you're going to be taken in by a liar. Verse 43, I've come in my Father's name, not even my own name, and you don't receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. You're going to say, oh yeah, this is the guy. Cool. But he's the wrong guy. And you know, that's happened over and over and over again. And whenever that happens, it always results in catastrophe. That is, after the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70, there arose a guy claiming to be the Messiah. His name was Simeon Bar Kochaba. I'm pronouncing it wrong, but Gil knows it. And this guy claimed to be the Messiah, the leading rabbi of the time, Rabbi Akiba, says, I endorse him. He is the Messiah. This guy led the Jews to fight against the Roman Empire, and they lasted for three years. And then they ran out of food and supplies, and the Romans killed over 580,000 Jews. More than that number died of starvation and disease. And then they sold all the Jews as slaves. And it says that there were so many of them to be sold that the price of a Jewish slave was less than that of a horse. It just devastated the land. So they received him because he came in his own name. And the result was destruction. That's always the case. You remember a guy named Jim Jones in the United States claimed to be the Messiah. And he took his little cult and went to Guyana, founded a place called Jonestown. And when it looked like everything was coming to an end and the gig was up, he had all of his followers drink Kool-Aid that had poison in it. Killed over 900 people when they finally caught up to him. But it's always going to be like that when somebody comes in his own name. Not like Jesus who's coming in the name of the Father. Well, with all this testimony, they're rejecting Jesus. And Jesus says, you know what? You're not only going to be deceived by men, but you're going to be shocked when you stand before God. Because instead of God saying, hey, come on in, there's Moses going to be standing there, and he's going to say, don't let them come in. I don't know these guys at all. They're not my disciples. They don't belong to me at all. Can you imagine Moses standing before God saying, don't let them in. They don't belong to me. Is that a terrible shock? Does anybody ever get freaked out by thinking, what if I get to heaven and God says no? Think about that. That kind of tension, that kind of, oh no. Well, Jesus says, you know what? That's what's going to happen to you guys. Now, you know that Jesus understands the need for evidence. He does not expect anybody to be gullible and just believe anything about anybody. And you know, that's what people think that Christians are. They're stupid. Why? Because they believe. They'll believe anything you tell them. They're believers. So we're stupid, right? But that's not true. Because not a one of us believed Jesus the first thing. Every single one of us said, oh, wait a minute. I need a little proof here. And we actually had to go find that proof. I mean, we wrestled with it. Didn't you? I did. I didn't even want to be a Christian. Are you kidding? Become stupid <laughs> by my own choice? Do I have to? Man, that's embarrassing. And See, that's the other thing. What's going to happen to me when people find out? 
they're going to say, I'm stupid. I couldn't believe. You couldn't believe either. Not until you figured that one out. What's going to happen when they find out? Well, if I die, I die. That's when you start believing. But Jesus has testimony and evidence. And the, you know, the purpose of evidence is to establish fact. We're not talking about convincing and sweet talking until you go, well, okay, maybe, you know, if you sweeten the deal, I might go for it. But it's fact. You don't believe just to believe. You have to believe that this is real. You're accepting it as fact, as true. So you're entitled to ask for evidence. Now, if it's true, there's going to be plenty of evidence. And you get to look at it. And you should know the evidence. You should know human testimony. And you should know the divine testimony. You know, we get really embarrassed when it's time to witness. We're, we're like Hugh Grant. When it's time to witness, we stutter. We're kind of, oh, uh, 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 and we're just little bunny rabbits. And you know why? Because we're not confident. We don't know the evidence. But the evidence here is so good and solid and true, we should know it, folks. We should know this stuff. So when somebody says, oh, Jesus junk, we go, you know what? It's more real than what you're standing on right there. And eyewitness testimony saw Jesus dead and raised from the dead. So, I have nothing to worry about. I'll see you in a hundred years. We don't have to take anything off of anybody because this is true. But you should know this stuff. Okay? Here's Jesus saying, you know what? You should have no problem believing me. He expects you to believe him. You ever testified and you weren't believed? Has that ever happened to you? We're going through this right now with uh, Mission for Vision and the court in Brussels where they've gone in time after time to give evidence and testimony and it's all there. These are facts, facts, facts. And the prosecutor kicks it back. It's weird when you've got fact and you expect it to be accepted as fact and yet Ah, it doesn't count. You go, wait a minute. Are you calling me a liar? But that's what they're saying. They're saying, nope, that certificate from that university doesn't count. And those pictures don't count. And that written testimony doesn't count. None of that stuff counts. You're a liar. And you go. <laughs> what do you do? See in court. Do you have a lawyer? Uh-uh. What are you going to do? Tell them the truth. That's all I have. No fancy, smart-talking lawyer is going to get me off. Either they believe the truth, or that's it. They're focused on a lie. They only want that lie, and that's it. That'll happen in front of men, but not before God, because He is the truth. So, you know, it says in 1 John 5, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. 
Now, you know, ultimately, those of us who believe in Jesus were convinced of this fact, that Jesus really is from the Father, that he really did die for our sins, that he really did rise from the dead. We were convinced. And there's a way to be convinced. You have to open up yourself and you have to receive the evidence. And if you receive the evidence, then you'll know. Now, Jesus says, you got to have his word abiding in you. And this is a challenge. And I love doing this. I have these little Gospels of John. They're cheap printed and they look like heck. But it is the Gospel of John. So if you get past the cover, you're doing pretty good. And I give them out and I say, look, I'm giving you this for free. This is the Gospel of John. You take it and you read it before you throw it away. Read it. And read the whole thing through. Don't stop at chapter 3 and say, did that. You got to read it all the way through. And here's what you say. Okay, God, if you're real, you show me. Just show me you're real as I'm reading this. This is supposed to be from you. You show me. And I say, if you get all the way through that and God hasn't shown up, then you can throw it away. You gave God a shot and you were reading his word. Okay, fine, fair enough. But I bet you, before you get done, he's going to show up. It's all yours. You do it. You know what? Don't let a guy convince you because guys are selling soap. And they don't care about you. All they want you to do is buy the soap. God is different. He doesn't need anything you've got. He wants to save you. That's what he says. I say these things that you may be saved. And so, if you want the truth, you can have it. But let him convince you. Not a smooth-talking guy who can talk fancy to you and then you sign and you think, what did I just do? Let God convince you. Now what happens if you say, well, I got a weak faith. I kind of believe, but I kind of don't. Don't you hate that? Do you know what it is? You're not putting that word in your heart. So you have a very superficial relationship with the word of God. It's no wonder you don't believe. But what would happen if you just sat down with God and said, okay, help me to put this in my heart. You teach me about yourself. You know what you're going to find? It's going to go into your heart. It's going to make roots go deep. And it's going to bear fruit. It will do this. That's what seeds are for. It would be a miracle if it didn't do that. So really, all you got to do is put it in you. Does everybody hear me on this? All right. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you understand, you know, that we need to have evidence. And we thank you that you give it, that you give such divine and sufficient evidence so that we know we're not being deceived so that we know that Jesus really is the Messiah, the Son of God. And so, Lord, we don't want to be convinced, sold, But we want, to, we want you, Lord, to impress this on our hearts. And I pray that, that every single one of us would really know the evidence. 
the things that we've handled and touched and seen and heard concerning the word of life. Do a great work. Draw every one of us to you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind.